أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد والثناء لرب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب قلوبنا وشفيق ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا أبو القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واهل الاقطه من لساني يفقه قولي I want to share with you um, an approach uh, that I am calling this the techy approach that's an acronym T E C C I each one of these letters represents a concept and the uh, we'll talk about each one of these concepts in this workshop today each uh, one of these helps to facilitate the ultimate goal of having a happy home a harmonious household and to help us to build and uh, foster relationships with each other especially in the context of our homes and households this isn't the end all be all of approaches but it's one that um, is very useful if it's used properly there's some overlap in these categories and you'll get a sense of that as we go along um, but the theme that is consistent throughout all of these um, concepts is that they all require care and we have to approach this with care the first letter T represents truth truth is a necessity to build trust in a family dynamic where people are often close-knit to be able to have good relationships trust is a must and a most critical foundation you know we should learn truth before speech this means that we have to emphasize understanding and having the disposition of being truthful even before we get to the focus of the different etiquettes of speech they're all important and have their own place but they can't take precedence over truth itself a lot of times in our society, there's a lot of emphasis on the proper social etiquettes, how to speak, what to say, um, what to say to whom, and different things like this. But again, all of those things, all the proper etiquettes, without someone being truthful in their speech, it's missing the mark, right? And we want people to be truthful with us. So this truth is a baseline for creating trust. In the home, sometimes a no consequence rule is really helpful, especially for children, um, that they can feel safe to speak the truth. A lot of times when people move towards modes of dishonesty, it has a lot to do with trying to avoid a consequence, um, worry or fear about something that might happen. But if you knew that you are safe, if you spoke the truth, then that would be all the more reason to be comfortable in doing that, and hence that trustful relationship. Openness is very important to be able to hear and listen to someone when they are speaking the truth. Right? Um, in the parent and child dynamic, it's, and other dynamics as well, there's a lot of times a kind of symbiotic relationship. Um, and then even when it's emphasized in a lot of uh, parenting, for example, approaches that things should be child-led or child-centered, or this is one approach. Kids are curious, and they have a lot of curiosity. 
that will mean that there's a lot of questions. When those questions are coming and being presented from whoever is asking, um, it's important that we take time and care to be truthful in our responses. We don't have to know the answer to everything, but we have to be truthful, even if that means I don't know, even if that means learning together, even if that means, hey, you know what? One of the good uses of the internet, obviously going towards a trusted resource, not any place on the internet is neither safe nor accurate, but by using that, that could be a means to create trust. Sometimes we run into not knowing and assume that this is a roadblock when in reality this is an opportunity to build trust embrace those moments where we don't know things that's okay and use that as a means to hey let's learn together let me look this up let me find out and maintaining that foundational block of trust we shouldn't make empty promises or have broken promises these have a lot of consequence on building trust in a relationship. When I say broken promises, I'm talking about uh, those promises that a person intentionally abandons. Maybe at one time they were going to do it, but then they intentionally abandon this, and this creates for mistrust, right? Or it's an empty promise. Something someone tells someone else, they tell their spouse, they tell their child, sure I'll do such and such but it's not coming from the heart it's not sincere there's not an intention to follow up with that and so this empty promise over time creates distrust we have a saying that the about the bitter truth this idea that sometimes truth is bitter and actually when you study different social sciences, it kind of suggests the idea that lying or being dishonest is a social norm and that actually it's a way to navigate to be, um, to facilitate relationships. But this is kind of contradictory to the idea that the foundation has to be built on things that are true and not on falsehoods and not on things that are not true. But at the same time, the approach and how truth is presented is important. It's not always what is said, but sometimes how it's said. Right? So maintaining the truth is important, but the presentation and the, or the delivery or the accuracy and how we consider who we're speaking to, the age of the person, and different things like that are also important. Sometimes truth may seem bitter or harsh. That doesn't mean that it doesn't have a place. We have to be calculated, measured, calm, and if people had been rough, are harsh in their speech, people would disperse away from them. The calm and the measure in the truth helps this truth to reach the mark, helps people to be able to even hear. This is not to say, this is not a anti-upset, anti-anger approach where it's considered problematic to be upset about some things. No, there's a place for that. When the truth is that, it's uh, oppression. When the truth is that, there's a severe harm. When the truth is that, it's a massive injustice to someone innocent. That's a place where we should feel upset. That's a place where we should feel um, some sense of being disturbed. I mean, we should feel anger in proportion but that motivation should help us to fix and rectify things. But that anger or that kind of uh, sense of harsh truth, so to speak, that's best reserved for the outside world. That's best reserved for 
other places outside of the home. The home has to remain a place that's calm and that's comfortable. The homes that are not like this are the homes that even the members of the home want to sometimes be away from or choose to be distant from. So proportionate, measured, calm creates an atmosphere where truth can uh, thrive, where it can be uh, facilitated and trust can be facilitated. One of the things about anger is that even in truth, even if the person person is 100% honest, when it's anger that's taking over that, what happens is that that anger is like a flame. Everything it touches gets destroyed. It engulfs. It takes over. It consumes. So that has no place for creating a thriving relationship in the home. We have to be extremely careful about that. Sometimes with that truth comes a sense of self-righteousness and that can uh, uh, spill over and become into its form of harshness. And that makes the objective uh, lost completely. One of the most important ways to foster this reality of truth and to build upon this in our family dynamics is to build a relationship with God. It's absolutely pertinent. If we consider God's word to be the truth and that resonates with us and we're able to understand and contemplate and reflect on it, then we have to build a relationship with God through conversation with God. But what does that look like? When you want to hear God, open the Quran, open his holy book, and listen to his words, and listen to what he has said, how he has said, when we want to talk to God, pray. And in our prayers, they should come from the heart and be sincere and truthful, obvious, obviously. And they should uh, uh, reflect our hopes, our aspirations, our dreams but they should also reflect our sorrows, our frustrations, our hurt. And that conversation with God of prayer and reading his holy book are ways that we are able to create that relationship with God. Someone centered in their relationship with God is someone who's going to be centered in their dynamic with other people as well. One of the ways to facilitate this relationship with God is taking a daily message from God. Pick up and open up his book to a random place and see what comes off of that, what resonates with you. What is he talking about? What is that story about? What is that virtue? Contemplate and reflect on it. This taking a message and seeing how it applies to your daily life, how it applies to what you're dealing with, what you're going through, what your concerns are, this helps to build and foster that relationship with God. For younger people, it's important to facilitate this relationship. And in terms of the holy book, it's important to contextualize God's words in a meaningful way and in a way that's youth friendly, age friendly, developmentally appropriate so that they can they can understand it easily. Good translations, these are things that help those words to resonate with us. Creating that moral sensibility and that truthful disposition 
for a young person even. And if you can, if a person could start this from a young age and maintain this over time, they would have an incredible relationship with God. The last point of the truth concept is to be real, to be sincere. This also connects to the next theme which we're about to get to. As an example, you may have heard of something called love languages, where there are particular modalities or particular approaches to expressing or conveying love to someone else. Any of these expressions, if there's not sincerity there, will likely miss the point and miss the mark. Instead of getting stuck on the love languages, understanding the language of sincerity is going to be a lot more significant. Someone being sincere. There's so many parents, I imagine, that have uh, artwork made out of macaroni and other kinds of things. And this artwork probably wasn't something that if they went to their a department store, they would look for, they would buy. Why do they love it? Because it came from the heart. It was so sincere that it was, it was made with love. It was made with care. It came from a genuine place. And that genuine gift sometimes resonates so much more than even an expensive gift or a gift that speaks to one of those particular love languages, for example, or a mode or a thing that speaks to one of those particular approaches. So sincerity and making sure that that's a central theme in our truth and how we, and that would be the reason why someone wouldn't be uh, harsh in their, in their family dynamic when they're trying to convey truth is because of this sincerity because they care about um, uh, how things are conveyed and they want to do it with love and care. Techie, T-E-C-C-I is the name of the this approach. E, the next concept and the next letter in the acronym represents empathy. Every relationship requires care. And, and there is, as I said, some overlap in how these all connect to each other. And they're very much complementary. Um, in fact... I would say empathy is something that when there's truth and sincerity together, they allow empathy to flourish. It's like ingredients that you're baking. And truth and sincerity would be the flour and the water that you're mixing together to make this dough called empathy to make whatever thing you want to bake, whatever wholesome treat that you want to have, um, these things help to make put that together. At the same time, while empathy means that I care and I reflect on and I consider someone else, their truth, their, um, their feelings, their emotionality, what they're going through, and I consider that in my delivery and my and how I convey to them and that means that I'm sincere with them, all of these things together. The absence of these things creates a kind of anti-care vibe, a anti-empathy um, sentiment. What does anti-empathy look like? Anti-empathy might look like someone utilizing I love you as a statement for a gain as opposed to for conveying this truth and for creating a bond and, and, and nurturing that dynamic. It might look like someone when they're tasked with or when they're presented with 
helping someone in need. They pat their pockets and pretend to look sad because they don't truly, sincerely, not in truth, not in sincerity, they don't want to help this person. So this presentation of pretending to care is anti-empathy. It means that they, there is not care in that dynamic. If someone sees a homeless person, someone who's down on their luck, someone who's unhoused, someone who doesn't have, and they say to them something like, would money help your situation? Would common sense help your situation? Would a brain help your situation? Someone might think to ask because it would be almost absent of care. Or someone takes their the money that they have. They tell the same homeless person, hey, I was saving this to buy myself. This $10 was gonna buy me some coffee, but I can give that to you if, if that will help you, if you need that. And this kind of anti-empathy, these anti-empathy statements, anti-empathy actions, they create impositions. And instead of fostering care and bond between two people, appreciation, they usually actually create distance between two people. And it's kind of presented as being someone caring, but it may not actually be there. So these anti-empathy offerings that are riddled with um, disingenuousness and imposition we have to try to find ways to avoid these another way to facilitate empathy is by having good social dynamics good friends friendship and a good friend is like the necessary, most necessary ingredient for every food. Some might say it's like the salt that you have with food, that without any salt, sometimes it can be hard to consume. Or whatever that necessary ingredient is uh, for you. Sometimes those friendships are not easy to find. So we have to have some means to facilitate them. We have to have some way where if, for example, uh, my spouse or my children, if they don't have as many friends or they don't have a very a strong dynamic in their friendships, how can I help that to increase and nurture that? Or how can I help to facilitate that so that they have that? One of these things is based off of interest and activities where you can bond over the activity and over the interest. If you have a, a interest in Legos, then maybe create a Lego club. Horseback riding, create a horseback riding club or group or event that you get together and these friendships um, help to create those healthy modes of empathy of understanding someone else and being understood and then that translates within the family as well not just outside of the family communication um, that's intentional and meaningful also helps to facilitate friendships like kind of like back in the day they would call it pen pals and people would actually write letters put them in the mail and mail them to someone and maybe they will become friends this way or someone who they know maybe they had a relationship where they uh, sent letters to each other and we've moved so forward with technology now that there's an app for everything and um, many other ways and uh, to communicate with each other we can be use different modes of this communication as well each one of them has its own unique benefits. So writing letters is something I would encourage. It's something that um, has a different and unique feel uh, than probably an email does that can get easily discarded and you know overrun with all the spam and other things like that. 
team oriented activities um, sports team sports other things like that are also good opportunities for collaboration sacrifice sharing um, uh, sacrificing you know your role or um, being compassionate to someone else uh, dealing with adversity all of these things are things that help to foster that that principle of empathy what about within the home within our homes it's also important to facilitate and foster this sense of empathy why it doesn't mean that every dynamic will have a strong bond even within a family some siblings might not get along sometimes some people may uh, be at odds for different reasons or have a gripe or have an argument those harsh truths that sometimes push us away from each other things like that someone whoever those are within the family or more wise more understanding have to help to facilitate dynamics where everyone's uh, light and genius is able to be recognized everyone's different different personalities but also different talents and one person may not really know that what that is so help each other to understand what's your talent what's the other person's talent what's the dynamic this helps to create bonds within our families. We can't assume, you know what they say about assume. I don't wanna just assume that oh, everyone now knows that this person is a great this, or this person has great logic skills. This person is very intuitive. This person has um, great insights and good commentary. This person is very, you know, funny. Help us to nurture these things by recognizing and highlighting these things. These create appreciation between siblings, between uh, husband and wife, and every dynamic. You know, let's learn to highlight and recognize um, those geniuses and those talents and give context to them for others so that others can also begin to appreciate this and no one feels uh, left out of uh, the household <clears throat> another way to facilitate empathy is through reading and reading many I'm sure many librarians and book lovers would say that books are a man's best friend um, because of so many different things that you can take and benefit from them and it's used as a, a very important um, process in a lot of different um, education, psychology fields. In a family, bedtime stories, for example, for the little ones are something that will help them to grow in a lot of different ways. But it's not limited to that kind of reading that creates a care dynamic for sure. There's even studies that help us to understand that adults often really benefit from and enjoy being read to, not just children. Although that's usually the dynamic that you know we talk about. But even as adults, being read to, and maybe this is where audiobooks and things like that have become, you know, very popular. Different ways to do this as well. Some families, they read together. They might read their holy book together. They might read a particular story. Maybe it's a story that is inspiring. It's a story of courage. It's a story of um, uh, the downtrodden becoming the victors, you know. It's a story of something that create, helps them to understand each other. It's a story with characters and seeing how the characters resonate with the people who are reading and the listeners. You know, all of that helps to foster that sense of empathy and that sense of care. Sometimes in these uh, read aloud dynamics or read aloud sessions rather, it's 
helpful to have people, if possible, to take turns in that reading or to share in that reading and for everyone in the family to be a part of that and to participate in that. Reading parallel. This is another idea that is very creative, but it's intentional. It means that, for example, let's say, hey, this Sunday morning, this Sunday afternoon, for a couple of hours, we're gonna have some snacks and share with everybody in the family. And everybody's gonna have their own book that they're reading. And they're reading independently and quietly, but they're doing it in the same space. Everyone has a comfortable, cozy spot. They have, you know, their snacks to eat and everyone's just kind of chilling. But this simultaneous chilling creates a bond even if no words are being spoken. These are the deep, deep um, aspects of empathy that you're nurturing at that time. Nature energy. Nature energy is very powerful. When we stop to think they ponder creation. They reflect on its existence. They reflect on existence. They reflect on the different forms and variations in creation. Reflecting on the different colors, the different languages that exist, the different tongues, the variations of creatures. How do they sustain? How does the bird sustain itself? How do the trees and grass and all of these things, they're glorifying. We don't always understand. Or what does that look like and what does that mean? Just the mere reflection on that creates a nurture within us. Where we can start to think about why and how someone's, what is someone's genius and talent and what talent and light, what is that like? And now suddenly our relationships start to resonate on a deeper level. When we look at the things in creation and we ponder their benefits, this helps us to see that same thing, that same light that we want to, that we should be able to or hope to be able to see in others. What is the benefit of this herb? Does it have a medicinal benefit? Does it have a herbal um, psychological benefit does it have some benefit that it heals some wound is it dangerous is it safe how does it fit into its ecosystem what animals benefit from it is it helpful or harmful in this space or that space thinking about and considering about these things even just about the plants and the trees and the things that are in creation they will help us to create a sense of consideration for others something that we can replicate in our social spaces grounding and means to uh, some people like to barefoot walk upon the earth walk upon the sand walk upon and feel and sense a connection to the earth. Part of this idea is that using this as a mode to connect to everything that is connected to the earth. So by not, when I step foot on that grass, even though that grass is soft and resilient, but it's also, it can handle my stomping. When I, press my foot against it and I think about the earth and all those who have traversed this earth all those who have been here who have come before me will come after me that consideration creates a sense of empathy and care for others when I realize that 
wow, I'm connected to the earth that's connected to this land, that's connected to that country, that's connected to the other country, that's connected to the globe. That helps to foster that sense of care. Wow. When we were talking about connecting with the Creator and connecting with God and relationship with God, you can see how that helps in this space as well. I would call this spiritual grounding. If we can connect with God, then we have connected with everything that exists everywhere. That spiritual grounding is powerful in terms of our ability to appreciate others, to be able to have modalities that resonate with others and that sense of care. Engaging in outreach. Um, this is a, a family activity or process that can really foster this sense of empathy and care um, outreach to help others primarily to um, facilitate the help of others and charity starts at home of course um, and extends and levels beyond that to our outer families to those in need to all the people in society, especially those, especially those who are uh, virtuous among us and those who are going to be the most helpful among us. But we want to look at this outreach and these kind of things with a deeper and more empathetic lens. And uh, for example, that might look like not just making a sandwich or taking some, a box to uh, a care package to feed someone who's unhoused. It might look like digging deeper into the process or digging deeper into the reality of why are they homeless? Why is their homelessness existing? And considering this, when someone eats a meal or three meals a day, which many of us may consume three meals a day, uh, 21 meals a week, or perhaps even more than that, but when we consider that we consume these, for example, three meals a day and 21 meals a week, and maybe we engage in a, you know, activity of outreach, of, of sharing once a week, um, something to help a box or a charity or something of this nature, we have to consider that we haven't really made a dent in some ways, it's meaningful but it also hasn't changed the dynamic of poverty that exists in our society. So empathy with a deeper lens means let's have conversations within our family where we discuss how can we remediate? How can we be those who make amends in society and fix these social problems? Yes, I can help this person and that's important and meaningful. But why is this like this? What's the systemic issue that exists that allows this to be like this? Is it simply that the person should be to blame and they didn't try hard enough? Or are there a lot more to the story and a lot more reasons of why this exists? So considering these reasons and not thinking about um, them in terms of they solutions. I'm talking about, oh, other people, they should do this. Or people solutions, a group of people should do this and make this. Instead of thinking of those solutions, which are kind of in that anti-empathy space a little bit, let's think of I solutions. What does Hussein Mekki need to do? I can do this. We, my family, can do this. We can help this way to facilitate and remove a, um, a problem that is contaminating our society. <clears throat> But getting to the last um, points of the empathy, and that is to express lots of uh, love and lots of hugs within our families 
It has to be a space where there's lots of that, lots of high fives, lots of hugs, lots of love, lots of fist bumps, ways that we show and express our solidarity, express our care, um, open forms of expression. We shouldn't shy away from these. These are very important and are important to be expressed in every dynamic. And the parents and husbands and wives have to model this and model this within the uh, home as well so that there's healthy dynamics of care. And the last point is to listen with care. Just listening. One of those divine attributes to hear, but not listening with motivation to respond only. Listen to respond, no, listen to understand. Listen to know what is being said and why it's being said. To hear fears, hesitations, joys. Listening for understanding is very different than just listening to give a response. Let's move on to the next concept and the next theme, which is C, the first C, which represents confidence. You are capable beyond measure. We have talents that we haven't even unearthed, unlocked, hidden, unknown. Maybe we haven't tapped into them. It's important to let that be known within families that, hey, you might have skills that you don't even know. Don't underestimate yourself. I don't underestimate you. I see you as more than capable. Everyone has light. What does that look like? How did that, how does it manifest for each person? By being able to highlight this, it creates a sense of confidence. Uh, confidence is holistic. Mind, body, spirit. And we have to facilitate confidence so that it is nurtured and actualized in mind, body, and spirit. It's helpful to sometimes reframe or reshape something that would hinder confidence. A fear. A kid that has a fear of spiders. I see in a family where they reframe this aversion to spiders by creating this friendly spider dynamic where there's a friendly spider named Incy. And Incy would play with the kids. And it was just the parents making their hand look like a spider and doing silly and funny things. This caused them to be able to grapple with that fear in a way where it wasn't so much so debilitating anymore. And they were able to overcome that and they gained confidence. We can be creative in what approaches we use to help to overcome uh, fears, but those things foster confidence. When someone in our family does something, we should recognize it, highlight it. When they have an accomplishment, when they have an achievement, a good report card, when someone is successful in their business, if someone makes a good meal, these things are important to take a moment to recognize and highlight, to give props to. When we do this, uh, this recognition, this appreciation, it helps the person to feel that um, they're capable and it helps them to replicate this. A child that does successful artwork and gets that artwork put on the wall will we'll make the siblings do that. They'll be inspired. Fill your walls with beautiful artwork that your children do. Or 
that your spouse does, whatever that recognition looks like within the home so that the home uh, is representative of the people within the home and representative of their talents and what they bring to the table and their beautiful lights and that they're able to walk through their home and see like a hall of fame kind of place where they can feel appreciated and see the appreciation tangibly you know throughout the home encourage striving for ourselves first strive never give up we don't even know what we're capable of if we do give up and as long as we recognize that continuous striving increases us and get, makes us better makes us closer to um, the best possibility of what we can achieve or the best perfection of what we can achieve it teaches us that no matter what a circumstance is we can make it better and this is a very important nobody's flawless right? and Many people will make mistakes. We all have shortcomings in some capacity. Striving teaches us that we can fix so many of these mistakes. We don't have to leave them as mistakes. Striving in that sense of the motivation to continue and to try, it gives us the reality that even if this isn't what it what I wanted it to be right now, or it wasn't at all what I uh, intended, or I did intend at that time, but I'm regretful now and I want to change it, it gives a room for that. It gives possibilities, endless possibilities. No one has to double down down a path of wrong or mistake. They can always find a way to rectify that. Right? So teaching striving to fix mistakes, even if they're in the past to rectify them. Why not? We have to facilitate within our homes, as we said, confidence. It, um, oh, it, it extends to mind, body, and spirit. And so when it comes to the body and our physical well-being and our health, we have to be conscious and cognizant that even if we feel confident in our mind, or in our heart, so to speak, but our bodies are, you know, overfilled with sugar, it might feel too stagnant to perform the act that we're so confident even about. Being mindful of the things that make us stagnant, finding healthy alternatives and options is one way to help facilitate confidence within our family. Healthy snacks. It doesn't, this is not to say that, you know, never have any treats or anything like that, but it's about finding a health, a, a good balance, having moderation, and then also finding alternatives. And in many cases, you might find that the alternative even tastes better. You know, there's many things that may be made with honey, tastes even better than made with sugar. You know? um, so finding those solutions and different cultures, different um, tastes and different uh, inclinations may leave for different room to figure this out. Uh, consuming enough uh, water so that we feel hydrated, again, not to things that usually make us sluggish, not being hydrated enough. Everybody in the home and the family should have a water bottle and we should make sure that we're in the habits of filling them up and hydrating you know, throughout the day, and reminding each other to make sure that we have uh, some hydration. Some families like to use water as first water, then, then uh, juice or other forms of other treats and things like that as a way to uh, make sure that prerequisite is, is met. Whatever dynamic, you know, works, but encourages this to happen. As we mentioned, uh, sports are important in that dynamic of collaboration and other aspects that foster empathy, but, but sports are also very important to foster um, a sense of confidence. 
A lot of times, a sport requires repetition and practice to become good at it or to become good at a particular move or a particular aspect of it. But when we're able to replicate that and do that, we we um, acquire a successful or a success. That success gives us a sense of confidence. So shooting the basket and seeing that shooting, uh, seeing the basket go into the hoop, maybe seeing the repetition of that creates a confidence for that person. And first, in the scope of that that uh, task that they're doing or the sport that they're playing as a whole. But that transcends to other boundaries where they know that if I do something and I strive and I'm consistent and I give effort, or even if I'm one-off lucky from time to time, that trying or that sense of what that is means that I can be successful. And there's the confidence right there. And obviously, sharing uh, stories of success in that regard are important as well. You know, there's a lot of stories of people who you can see their confidence um, just overflowing because of their success in a particular sport. Those models of what that looks like are important for us to have a sense of or a frame of reference of to know that this is possible, you know. We have to facilitate confidence within the self. And... You can say again that here is another time when our relationship with God comes to play. Uh, The person who has trust in God or who has belief in God and realizes or believes that God is the one who facilitates and helps him to facilitate, that creates a tremendous amount of trust within himself. His self-confidence is not a delusion of his self and his limitations, but rather It's a reality of recognizing that he is capable through this connection. And and if you foster that connection, that can only increase you in confidence. We have to be mindful of the things that destroy confidence, especially for children. If you go to school, you... Especially if you are, for for example, and there's many different examples, I'll use uh, this example of uh, children, children of color. If you are a child of color, so you're an African American child, if you see every person who is a leader in your world, every teacher that does not look like you, if you see every hero that does not look like you, if you open a book, if you're a child who's uh, East Asian and you open a book and every time you saw a princess, they didn't look like you, why would you think that that you, that would hinder your confidence? That might make you think that you're not able to be that princess or that little girl that might think like that or for that. Uh, a young man, he might feel like, well, I can never be like this because I don't see myself in this way. These are the subtle aspects in society that can hinder confidence or foster confidence. Being mindful and aware of these things helps a child to um, foster that light. Racial, cultural um, uh, sensitivities is something that, in theory, religious sensitivities are something that at least in theory exists in our society but we have to make sure that we are intentional about um, this as it can greatly impact someone's ability to feel like they can be a practicing a Muslim even or a practicing religious person a young sister that never sees a reflection of herself And for example, if she's a hijabi, then that might hinder her confidence in wearing that hijab. um, And so on and so forth. There's so many uh, examples of this. Sometimes even in well-meaning spaces, um, this is something that's easily overlooked. There's so many religious books, well-meaning, well-intended for kids 
you know, where every single person looks the same, and oftentimes they are the uh, same problem that some of these big Hollywood companies ran into, where the white princess was getting gold and it was getting something that was not representative, with all respect to her. It was just not representative of all of everyone else in the world. It was just one default uh, representation that was considered beautiful, one default representation that did not consider all the many different variations and colors, um, tongues, and cultures that exist in the world. So we see where there's been a little bit of course correction probably in some Hollywood sphere where to some degree that this has been something that has been more cognizant, but that's been because people have cared about that and people have noticed that and people have uh, mentioned and brought that. But for children and a family, if we don't pay attention to these things, then they cause them to be people who are um, unempathetic to others because they don't see why they should be. They don't see that representation. Everyone in the book looks the same skin tone. So they don't get a sense of the difference in caring in uh, different people or the bad guys look darker. And so they get the sense that darker is problematic and lighter is better. And these are not reflections of that um, divine light by any means. And they hinder us as a society. They hinder the humanity within us significantly. And that's something that we have to rectify. Sometimes they do this in a task where they help children to um, to get a sense of this. And this is a good exercise maybe to do within families where people draw their own self-portrait. How do you see yourself, right? Do you see yourself with the features that you have? Or do you represent yourself when drawing with other features that look like someone else? There were a lot of East Asian cartoons where the characters look n nothing like what would be considered what many East Asians look like. And so uh, that representation can cause hindered and has hindered the confidence for some, some people in that respect. It doesn't need to be this way. We can rectify this and we can address this. And especially within our homes, we have to be considerate of this and model this. The last thing that I mentioned about confidence, and this is also a little bit more of the parent-child dynamic, is to encourage your children to have a voice in their attire and what they wear and how they dress themselves and how they, how they clothe themselves. Have you ever worn something you didn't like? When people have to dress in things that they don't like and, and sometimes they become consumed with it, preoccupied with it, they feel less confident, they feel bothered, they feel s extremely self-conscious about it. Um, this doesn't mean that there are not rules within the framework of the home of what's acceptable and what's appropriate but it means within the scope of that giving leeway and room for a kid to say well I like this and that 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 form of self-expression is very healthy um, it helps to stay within the framework and it also helps for them to uh, increase their confidence in in this um, uh, whatever they're wearing and, and that exudes you know for them we're moving on to the, the to the next team, uh, theme, to the fourth theme, and then we will have one more, which brings it to, uh, well, as we near the end of the workshop. The fourth theme is C, um, is the second C in Teki, and this C stands for creativity. There's nothing like, no matter how excellent something is, the mundane of it, and the routine of it, and the repetition of it, uh, and the monotony can cause 
its value to feel diminished or to diminish its value actually so finding creative ways to maintain things is a beautiful way to keep um, the fire alive within our families and those relationships to feel you know effervescent It's important as a means of confidence also to uh, prioritize the use of positive reinforcement. It's, it's the most effective way to um, create confidence, as we said, that, that um, recognition, that highlighting, that uh, gift giving, that reward is one of the ways that increases us in wanting to do that same, that same task. But we can also be creative in our modes of how we do that. Positive reinforcement need not be itself monotonous and and or anything like that. It can be very creative. There's so many possibilities of what that could look like. Um, I would encourage everyone to to understand the base ideas of uh, the ABCs. I'm talking about antecedents, the behavior, and the consequence understanding how these work and um, why positive reinforcement is definitely so much more important and effective than uh, punishment is very important. But then taking that to another level and finding what are the unique, the nuances that I can um, consider to make sure that I'm being creative in this process. So a child you know, there was a family that had a very nice dynamic of how they would do positive reinforcement. When someone did something um, helpful within the family, in the home, and it wasn't something that they were required to do or someone told them to do, and they um, took steps on their own to do this, there was a special recognition that happened. So for example, um, one of the children cleaned up an area that dad was going to clean up. So because the child cleaned it up and took the initiative, that by the time dad got there, he saw, oh wow, this is already done. And he was amazed at it. And he said, and so they had this dialogue that they would do. Who told you to do that? The dad would say. And then the kid would say, nobody. And then the dad will say, that's because you're a boss. Nobody tells you what to do. You're a boss. And so they will use this boss reference as a way to highlight this step that this person took to help in the family, right? But it was a creative way to recognize this initiative. And we need to be creative with how we do positive reinforcement because it's that creativity that, uh, that really helps to open so many other doors and possibilities. Relationship with the creator can help with creativity. As we were thinking about that uh, empathy and empathetic approach to nature and considering, you, know, you see this little bug, what does it do? How does it do it? You know? How many of these are there? So many different species. Why does this one do like this and that one doesn't? And some have this many legs and some have a different number. And what does that look like? That consideration helps us to have more frames of reference, more ideas, more concepts, more thought, creativity, more possibilities of how to do even the same thing or how to facilitate that. We have to see creation as marvelous, magnificent. And when we do that, we're able to, that helps us in our uh, consider, uh, in, in having considerate and creative um, approaches to how we do positive reinforcement or how we do activities or how we engage in different things as a family. You know, we talked about creative ways of reading parallel reading, reading out loud, different things like that. Creative ways of engaging in um, uh, watching a show together, 
Maybe there's discussion. Maybe there's insight. Maybe we're discussing what happens next. These, these creative approaches are very useful for building bonds within our families. Also, we have to facilitate interest. Sometimes you might see where a child, for example, went a little on the deep end and writing on the walls and drawing on the walls and got a little too creative with their graffiti. Instead of approaching this too harshly, remember the harsh truths often are not, the, the home is not the place for them. Or they don't, they uh, can really hinder our bonds. Maybe finding a way to reorient them constructively. Well, we've got a little artist over here, an artista. That's quite a talent you have. Redirecting that. Let's get, let's get into, there's a, there's a really cool art class. You know, would you be interested in that or helping to facilitate that, you know, to learn more about that so that that can be a healthy outlet of creativity. That could have been the world's greatest artist, but if you approach them with a harsh tone or a harsh reproach, they might stunt their growth in that field forever. They may never know, they may never unearth that talent. A kid that likes to mix things. Some kids like to play with shampoo and use all of the shampoo or mix it with something else, or play with it, or different things like that, or the hand soap. <clears throat> um, this might be frustrating for some people, but what if we could reorient ourselves to recognize how significant that moment is? You know, Hindering that interest in the mixing and um, understanding of these different liquids might be the reason why that child grows up to be someone who fails chemistry, has no interest in it, has no interest in uh, science anymore, or has an aversion to it because they grew to uh, have a disdain for these things or feel that these things are problematic. We can reframe this in a different way. You know, well, Looks like you're somebody that might like a science kit let's get you some cool science kits wow look at this amazing experiment what, what that you made here what do you call it finding other ways to reframe this you know these kind of things shampoo and soap and and are these kind of things walls can be cleaned those shampoo can be replenished and you can buy it again but that confidence and that creativity can be hindered for a life, for a lifetime. And, and that's not something that we want to do when we're trying to foster bonds and relationships within our home. Be creative in the normal things and the routine things that you're already doing, right? Um, there's a family that liked tea. And they had one of those little pots that, you know, you press the button and it boils the water. And they would make tea, you know, for everyone um, throughout the day. They liked herbal tea. Some people like other teas, whatever they liked. Anyway, they made this a kind of, uh, they added a kind of spiritual element to their task of drinking tea every day and they did this by taking some zamzam water a bottle of this holy water pouring a few drops into this big teapot and then they would make the tea so the the tea the drops of zamzam boiled into all of the, the overall water making the whole all of it kind of a holy water and they all drank this kind of holy tea and they enjoyed this kind of spiritual aspect that they added this creativity to something that they were already doing with a few drops. 
You have to encourage trying. Sometimes the thing that stifles creativity is our own reservations to try new things, to taste new things. Encouraging try just a little bit, you know, if, if a person can, is a way to overcome that little bit by bit. Over the course of time, we find that we have an openness to more different things and our palate is more open. You know, that creativity in and of itself allows for more possibilities within our home. Remember, uh, one of the things that stifles creativity the most is being married to our own ideas, our own thoughts. Feeling so passionate, passionately about an idea that we have, a thought that we have, a way that we do things, so much so that we are blinded to the reality of other possibilities that exist. We can't even look at them. We're so consumed with the idea that our idea is good and important. We're so married to it in sickness and in health, in good for good or for better or for worse. Being married to an idea is, it's a uh, dispositional deficit that hinders us, that hinders every person who is like this tremendously. No matter how good of an idea we have, we have to be willing to be able to detach from that idea, to consider other possibilities, and they may come from someone younger than us or older than us, or with a different view, but that possibility gives us, um, allows for us to creative modes. We have to recognize that no matter how good the idea, it came from somewhere. There's idea about, you know, something being original, so to speak, original. What does that mean? Original in a sense that, you know, for example, someone's artistry is their own and they may be uniquely made it. But for their unique artists, for the strokes they use, for the uh, concepts that they implemented, for the colors they uh, uh, employed, for the uh, design that they made, for every single aspect of it, there was a frame of reference. Something they saw, something they watched, something they heard, something that inspired their heart for that creativity. If we're humble enough to recognize that even our own most original, most incredible work has some frame of reference, then we can see more possibilities in ourselves and in others, and in the things that we do, and in the approaches that we take. God is the original artist. Everything else is a frame, has a um, frame of reference. The most original of all thought and concept and idea and speech is his, and everything else is a frame of reference to something. And if we're able to understand that, again, that's kind of connected once again to that relationship with God and Creator. But if we're able to understand that concept, that helps a lot for us to um, uh, aspire to new forms of uh, creativity and to embrace the different these different variations and to see those possibilities in others as well the last point on creativity is to utilize official things to help us to foster creativity meaning things like classes education skill oriented uh, learning things that help us to become more creative because we learn a new talent, a new skill. Start with this within the home. Let me take it a step broader and then bring it back. Within a community, within a mosque, for example, there's different people that have different talents and different education backgrounds and different skills. 
if we utilize just those skills and talents and everyone learn a little bit from each person, that will make them incredibly diverse in their capabilities. If the person who's an engineer taught some aspect of engineering, the person who's a teacher taught skills about teaching and education and, and, and or learning, learning modes. The person who is a uh, attorney taught about understanding lang legal language, understanding your rights, how to exercise them, how to champion them. All of these aspects, if a person can learn this skill, learn this talent within a c community dynamic, like a professional kind of uh, um, workshop or, 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 or seminar or something like that, is very useful within the family is no different and we should push for um, the people within our family to share the skills and talents that they have someone within the family is a beautiful reciter they have awesome recitation right they shouldn't they should be encouraged to share hey what inspired you within the family to share with other family members how they got inspired right? to share within their family what do they um, what are their secrets of success how did they get so good at this what do they use what do they recommend right? even if they're a young person this uh, creates an incredible amount of uh, gratitude and and also that same empathy and it makes that home uh, such that everyone is valued in a very unique way because of what they uniquely bring to the table and sometimes we have to understand that someone's talents may still be unlocked and hidden and exposure to these different classes skills and things like this or people who are successful is what allows them to realize or potentially try to um, learn their own open their own light and uh, foster their own sense of creativity. We move on to the last concept. I for initiative. We use the example, you're a boss. Nobody tells you what to do. Be a boss in your family. Not a boss because you're bossy and because we tell other people what to do, but a boss because you take initiatives that nobody needs to tell you. Those are the people who change the world. The people who are willing to take a step forward. Not waiting for someone else to say, hey, can you change the world or can you do something? Can you do this specific task? They're looking and they're taking the steps themselves or they're looking to see how they can make the world a better place. That initiative is very crucial. It's the, the cornerstone of leadership itself. There was a, a family that the kids loved Legos. And the kids were, uh, they were black, they were African American. And these kids loved Legos and looked at the Legos and began to ask their parents why there were no Legos that looked like them. Or there were very, very few. Or most of the times it wasn't an option. There was the ye yellow Legos or the yellowish looking Lego heads, but there were not really any um, other ones. So, again, with that truth that we talked about earlier about that be honest in response, the parents didn't just simply say oh you know some random response they didn't brush it off they said you know what let's find out i'm not sure why there aren't maybe there are maybe we don't know about it so they begin to look into it this led them down a path where they um, learned that that there was some limitations in this respect uh, from some of the companies that made a lot of these kind of bricks uh, and toys and that there were even other companies that only focused on having alternatives available to people who wanted that. So they began to order some things from different places so that they could foster that sense of confidence in their children. And also, they were teaching them initiative in real time, you know, 
we can take steps to fix things if they're not the way that we think are the best, right? We want to see a variation of colors, and we don't. Let's rectify that. And they went and did that. They um, helped the children and facilitated them to reach out to and write letters to the companies and say, hey, I'm a child, I'm a kid, and I really love this product, but I'd like to see a little more that look like me too. That would be really awesome, you know. These are the people that changed the world. You know, they took an initiative and to do that. I'll give another example of a family that they had a favorite ice cream brand. And so it was their preferred treat of choice, this particular brand of ice cream. At some point, they began to learn that the ice cream company also um, made cigarettes or some other things that they didn't really want to support. And they felt like buying that ice cream might be a problem because it supported something else that they didn't want to necessarily support. And so they took the initiative to ask the questions. Um, the older siblings took an initiative to help them to, uh, to contact the company. You know? And so these little kids got on a customer service call and started talking to people and asking them, do you guys support such and such a thing? Does your company make such and such a thing? And you can imagine that the customer service people probably were tickled by the idea of this kid asking these questions, but they explained that, you know, we like these, this ice cream and we just want to know what they support. That's important to us. You know, they were able to get some answers. Um, on another occasion, there was a problem, I think, with the ice cream, and they were able to, uh, the, the older siblings or the parents facilitated writing letters to the company. Writing a letter, hey, I got your ice cream, and it wasn't the same as it normally was. I was a little bit taken aback, you know, signed, you know, whoever the children. The company ended up sending them some coupons for free ice cream. They sent them a letter of apology. They tried to make up to them, you know, for the mishap. And this gave them such a sense of leadership and confidence and influence. Wow, we can change the world. So we can do things. We can take steps. There's things that we can do. But someone had to also show them that there is a way and guide them a little bit. But once they were able to... Um, take those steps, they actualize the potential that will resonate in every single dynamic of their life. You know, and within our home, we have to foster these senses of uh, initiative. We have to um, ensure and make sure that it's understood that there's agency and that you have choice. You know, who? W H O. We have options. You know, why not? Why do we have to do this way? Why do we have to accept this? Why can't we change the way things are? You know, you had a bad experience and such and such a thing. You can do something about this. This is how you can do this. And this is how you can make change. And you can make steps to that, to do that. Modeling servitude, modeling serving um, and servant leadership, especially um, for the leadership of the household is something that helps those who are younger to do that. Every parent would probably love to have a child that, um, especially as they grow older, cares for them, helps them, takes initiatives to offer them, uh, uh, fix them a plate, offer them tea, or things like that. This is a very um, beautiful and kind gesture that will resonate with pretty much every parent. If that's the case, then invest in that child by modeling that, you know, offering, serving the treat, making a cool treat, you know, um, saying things and doing things to show them that this initiative is the way to go, is what will help them to 
take those same initiatives in that same dynamic with the parent as well. In husband and wife relationships, the same thing is true, you know. Don't always, you don't always have to wait for someone to inquire. Sometimes taking an initiative is the most beautiful aspect that can exist for some things. For example, let's look at sometimes there's a concept in philosophy to learn things by learning the opposite of those things so let's look at an opposite scenario and then see how that makes initiative look like an incredible um, approach would you like me to tell you i love you says a husband to his wife should I love you today? Question mark. Versus, I love you. I love you today. I love you in so many contexts. In ways, different creative approaches to expressing that dynamic. Not needing to be asked to share affection, but initiative in that respect. It's very, very um, important. And, and sometimes, if it's not done, then it can really create distance between uh, two people. You know, everybody needs love and uh, uh, family dynamics. And that's one of the most important ways to foster um, relationships. But love is all of these things put together. Right? It's the truth, it's the empathy, it's the confidence, it's the creativity, it's the initiative. And when these ingredients are meshed together, they create for incredible love and a harmonious, happy household. There was a um, youth group and in our families, we can learn from this. They had a principal rule. And that rule was... Um, a rule about initiative and they came to this rule because of the opposite of what was happening in that in, in that sense meaning that they would have their group meetings and a lot of times someone would say hey you guys should do this or we should do this or they should do this or somebody should do this and it would be a good idea, maybe a great idea. But then when it came down to the, the idea, the uh, reality of who's going to do this, who's going to facilitate, who's going to take the time, the energy, who's going to make the effort, then the numbers dwindled down in terms of the, when it came down to those, those questions. So they made a principal rule that whoever makes a suggestion also must take the initiative oh we should do such and such okay just let's do it go right ahead begin start to do that put it together well, consequently one of the things that happened was the suggestions became a lot less and there were less suggestions overall because there was a consciousness and an intentionality understood that if I make this suggestion, I can't just pawn it off to someone else to do. I need to be willing to help this initiative to come to fruition. Okay. That was the basic outline for uh, the techie approach. Truth, empathy, confidence, creativity, and initiative. The last uh, portion of the workshop is touching on some of the obstacles, some of the things which may hinder us in being successful in doing this approach. The obstacles are, I will call them the usual suspects, the same problems that we kind of always run into in many other um, facets of our life, similar things may prevent and hinder 
the harmonious household that we'd like to achieve as well. What are some of those obstacles? Number one, status quo. Whatever is normal in society, everyone's doing it. This is what most families do. This is what most people do. Opting into uh, things that are the social norms or accepted or prevalent in society may not always be a solution. In fact, there's a lot of times when the things that are prevalent in society are the problems in society. We have to know how we can address them. We have to be able to address them within ourselves and obviously make sure that our families are aware of those as well. There is no covenant that exists that we must adhere to strictly, which we must abide by and do that which is prevalent. Our souls have no covenant with that which is prevalent in society. If it's something good, if it's something beneficial, if it's something useful, then that's one thing. But if it's something that's not helping us, if it's something that's hurting us, hurting our family dynamics, but we are committed to it, then we might want to choose to, to, to uh, abandon that commitment. Fascination with mediocrity winging it, kind of just getting some things done, doing a version of whatever the task is, not necessarily the best version of that. These are some of the things which really hinder our success. We have to ask ourselves a question in terms of our own self-refinement. Am I the best version of myself? no concern of to what anyone else thinks within ourselves asking ourselves am I the best version of myself do we wake up and wonder am I the best version if not am I striving to be the best version of myself am I even curious about what is the best version of myself mediocrity is one of those things that hinders so many things just skating by a person who strives to do their best is one of the best will always be one of the best the person that woke up every day and thought to themselves am I the best version of myself that athlete that asked that some, themselves that question is an athlete that constantly refined their um, their skill that honed their skill that was able to get to a place where that refinement reached a some state of uh, perfection and some state of excellence. A best version of themselves. That's the person that will be the champion. Every person who is a champion, who is a winner, is someone who kept asking themselves, is this, is this my best? Is someone who wasn't deterred by um, a small failure. They just looked at it as, okay, that's a stepping stone in order to get to my best. When we fall down a little bit, when we fall off our horse, we get right back up where we should. That's the striving mentality that helps to overcome this mediocrity. It helps to overcome this, um, this limitation. We have to believe in ourselves. We have to believe in those around us that they have more, they can do more. We have to find strategic ways with others to push them, to help them, to facilitate them, to realize that confidence and that capability, right? And we have to do that within ourselves as well so that we can uh, realize our, our potential. There's nobody who didn't succeed that strive. If you strive hard, if you try hard to be your best version of yourself, your best physical shape, your best mental state, your best, your best and most centered spirit, these are um, assets for the team. Everybody who works on being the best version of themselves makes the best team bar none. They make the dynasty bar none. 
diligence creates that winning. There's a status quo of in society's representation of things. We have to be mindful of that. Society has an idea when it comes to men and women, masculinity and femininity. This is its probably its own important topic and I want to just touch on it a little bit here. So much uh, of what is the truth of these, of masculinity, of femininity has been underrepresented. And then it's gone to, in so many ways, an overrepresentation and been overrepresented. What masculinity and femininity need in their representation is actually what they are. What are they? Balance. Balance. Proportionate, respective, representative, balance. Within the sphere of masculinity, there has to be a proportionate, representative, balance. Within the sphere of femininity, there has to be a proportionate, representative, balance. This helps the, uh, the men and the boys to be the best fathers, husbands, and brothers, and the girls and, and the uh, women to be the best moms, mothers, and wives, and sisters. When these two spheres are balanced and they are uh, moving in their balanced direction and they come together, they make room for a planet of balance, a whole family of balance. A life can be sustained through this balance. They can nurture this, they can nurture this cohesive unison and this cohesive unit because they're balanced within their own spheres. We have to take time to reflect on what that looks like. But what I'm talking about is not adhering to some particular, for example, Hollywood definition of what that is, you know, or something being shoved in our throats of what we need to expect this accept of this no we need to consider for ourselves and within our own realms be balanced in respective proportion and come together to complement this balance creating for powerhouse dynamic gratifying win for everybody The other tremendous obstacle is ego. And it's so, so, so many manifestations. Manifestations of arrogance and pride are some of the most popular. What happens with ego when we're sitting within our families? We think self-centered. We think with approaches that the world revolves around us our whims and our feels and we're not able to consider others so easily or we're counting the consideration of others we're not able to see the light in our children the light in our spouses the reality is is that ego is so detrimental we can't see the light within ourselves Because it takes a humbleness to recognize what that light is, where that light came from. It becomes a way that we are always deficit thinking and not asset thinking, seeing others as less, other ideas as less, other light as less. And it's very hard to have a um, incredible uh, loving relationship in any scope when that is the um, 
approach of someone. They say that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. We don't have to be the proverbial old dog. One of the things that keeps a person and their spirit alive and thriving and youthful is the ability to be open to new ideas and new possibilities, that same creativity that we talked about. I'm not talking about embracing every new agey mantra and idea and concept. I'm talking about being able to recalculate, reassess self. Okay, I thought this at this time in my life. The previous version of me thought like this, would do like this, recalculating, reassessing. I learned new things. I was privy to new light. I was privy to new understanding. My relationship in, with uh, this um, teacher, with this, uh, 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 with my family, with God, with uh, my empathy, um, these things have increased. And so now I'm recalculating and reassessing myself. And so I'm able to continue to learn and continue to thrive. These are people who never grow old. Age is a concept of how much we are um, able to recalculate and readjust and reorient ourselves to the light of the that exists within the world and where that is where that's being reflected from. That divine light. It requires a level of honesty within ourselves to be truthful. Maybe we need to abandon an idea or a way that we did things. Maybe we need to adopt a new way. If we don't do this, we're not the old dog, we're the dead dog. Because that which gives us life is that knowledge, is that awareness, is that comprehension, is that understanding. And if we choose to make it dormant, then we've chosen a dead path, a dead end. Confirmation bias is an obstacle. I have an idea, and so I want to prove my idea, and so I'm only looking to validate what I already believe and think and know and want to do. Seeking to confirm something inherently isn't a problem. Seeking to confirm something because that thing is a truth is a good thing. Seeking to confirm something because that thing is my opinion is a problem. I want to give someone advice. I, I don't consider their circumstance. I don't consider uh, um, anything. I just want them to know that this is what I want them to know. I want to confirm what I'm already what I already believe. This is an obstacle. It's a way to avoid our own truth. Overcoming this requires self-awareness and ongoing self-refinement. We get into the last obstacle, and that is one of those is time. Time. Shame on you as a friend. At the day's dawning and at the day's end. There's never enough time. For the person who has a sense of urgency and realizes that their time in this world is limited, maybe they make time. Maybe they try to reorient themselves to have time. We talked about um, doing things in conjunction with what you're already doing. The example of making the tea and, and, and modifying that in a way. I would say something like bring your kid to work day is maybe a, a positive way in a lot of ways to um, what someone's already doing. They're already spending time at a job, working, doing something, um, engaged in something for many hours. Now they're bonding and building a relationship with their, with their uh, child by helping them to see what their role is, what their responsibilities look like, what does their, their environment look like, so they have an understanding and awareness and appreciation you know, of each other. This 
may be um, a solution in a way when there's limited time. Maybe they couldn't have as much special time and quality time as they like, but they modified it by doing creating that special time and quality time within the scope of what was already happening in, in this example. Getting rest. There's not enough time to get rest, so we have to have some sleep, and we have to be balanced in this. There is all of these things done excellent and perfect, but a person is too exhausted to do them, and sometimes we are working extensively or studying extensively um, or doing things which are taking away from our ability to find uh, restful sleep. We have to find a balance in that, a moderation so that we're getting restful sleep. Not excessive, not too little, but enough to help us feel rejuvenated. That sense of feeling reju rejuvenated is its own confidence to help us to tackle the day. Um, creating this harmonious home is a process, and it does take time, but it's an investment. So we have to be willing to invest and willing to take time to get to those results. Lastly, even within a family, we have to learn to utilize. I gave some examples of siblings helping, older siblings helping with things, children helping parents, and a lot of different dynamics. Sometimes we need external help as well. It takes a village, as they say, and there's a lot of truth to that. A lot of people that bring different things to the table and experience and can help a person. In that taking a village and utilizing that, that's an important concept. At the same time, we don't want to outsource everything completely. There are sometimes, for example, parents that outsource the child rearing to um, other people so much so that those people are raising the child and the child has a better relationship with them than they do with their parent. And we have to have a balance when it comes to these things. Rest assured that um, there isn't a lot of time and that we will need to continuously make time. Time remains undeterred, relentless, moving forward maybe even hastily, it, it would seem. But if we're able to reflect on how we spent our time in the past and how we utilize all of these things in the past and use that as a base to move forward, then we'll be more careful in our approach and hopefully, uh, God willing, we'll be successful. I'm praying for your success. Please also say a prayer for my parents. Thank you.